things have definitely changed in the country once known as the most dangerous place on earth. Colombia is renovating its image as well as the kinds of places where you can stay. So you can look at anything from an old coffee hacienda turned into a boutique hotel to something really, truly romantic uh, on the coast. I mean, there's something for everybody there. Coming up, we get tips for enjoying South America's emerging tourist destination, Colombia. Back in the old world, trying to get business done in Italy can often be frustrating. We'll get an insider view of Italy's chaotic culture. I don't know if you ever really get used to it. You accept it, you learn that if you fight it, it's going to be worse. And you try to see the funny side of it. And we'll examine how the Immigration Act has changed demographic patterns in the U.S. over the last 50 years. It can be argued that no group has benefited more from the 1965 law than Asian Americans. It's all just ahead on Travel with Rick Steves. A lot of people travel with walls up. Bringing those walls down is what allows you to have those moments where you truly connect with new people and cultures. Rosetta Stone can help take down one of the biggest walls, the language barrier. Rosetta Stone is fun to use, you learn fast, and you can use it on your smartphone, tablet, or computer. For a special discount, go to rosettastone.com slash ricksteves. Coming up on today's Travel with Rick Steves, we look at how immigrants from Asia have become an important part of North America's identity. Erica Lee talks about her book, The Making of Asian America. And we'll hear how things are looking up in Colombia from Latin America travel expert Chris Baker in just a bit. We're at 877-333-7425 and by email, it's radio at ricksteves.com. Let's start out examining an old world disorder, if you like, in Italy. The Italians call it Bella Chaos, referring to the seemingly intractable bureaucracy and cronyism that pervades just about every area of life in Italy. It's sort of like admiring a big Baroque fountain in the middle of a busy intersection until you realize there's no good way to get across the street without getting run over. Giving us an insider's perspective are tour guides Cecilia Botai and Anne Law. Cecilia also helps run a family winery business near Orvieto. And Anne is an American who married an Italian and years ago made her home above Sorrento on the scenic Amalfi Coast. Cecilia and Anne, thanks for joining us. Thank, Thank you, Rick. Cecilia, bella caos. What is the word in Italian you say? Bel caos. Bel caos. caos. What is the Italian feeling about the craziness of life there? Do you recognize it or is everybody else just strangely organized? No, uh, we are used to it. And, you know, when we talk about Italy, it depends on where. Cows can be more or less intense, but we are used to it. So we always find a way around. It's a good way to train yourself. Since you were born with it, you know that you have to find yourself around because you wake up a morning and you don't know how you're going to finish the day. Every day is a conquer. That is what we say. <laughs> every day is a conquer. So there's a challenge to conquer every day. Absolutely. And you have to be creative. More than creative quick and creative. So you have to create quickly. Okay. Now, if you go to Germany and it's so efficient and so organized, does it just feel like boring? No, it's different. Yeah. You know that it, there is no creation required, but sometimes it gets a bit too flat to me. And Long, you've lived in Italy for 34 years. Does it feel um, workable? How, how do you deal with uh, the frustrations that come with becoming an Italian if you're used to American efficiency? I don't know if you ever really get used to it. You accept it. You learn that if you fight it, it's going to be worse than if you just accept it. And you try to see the funny side of it. Am I making too big a deal out of it, or, or is it really as chaotic and, and crazy as it seems to a tourist? It's awful. It, it's awful. And I say further south you go, the worse it gets in Italy. I'm down by Naples, and they invented uh, the word for chaos. <laughs> and they haven't invented a cure because they just like it the way it is. And it seems like it's so expensive for the the whole society. I was there for 16 or 18 days producing three TV shows, and I thought I did everything in advance to get all prepared, and I, I worked very diligently to cross all the T's and dot all the I's for our TV work. When I got there, it was all out the window and starting from scratch, visiting different bureaucrats, needing to get a little tax stamp, and they don't have the tax stamp here, so you got to go over to the kiosk or the little tobacco shop and they're closed today and then coming back and somebody's on vacation and and even the people in the bureaucracy were rolling their eyes and, and I remember they would say incredibile what is, what is the word Anne? incredibile incredibile see you you make them mad when you try to prepare ahead of time 
because that that's completely out of their realm of thought. So having all those papers say, listen, I already did this, this, and this, upset some, and they're going to put some more things in your way. And as an American, I thought, I did all my work. I've got this. My time is money, you know. Right. I got to do something in half an hour. Stamp this thing. Nope. And I lost my temper, and my friend uh, Francesca said, now we have to go buy flowers. <laughs> and we got to come back and bring her flowers and apologize. That's and right, then do it you again were rude. On her tempo. That's right. And then another frustrating thing was this notion of the responsible. What do they call the yeah, person? Yeah, the person who's, who's responsabile. Responsabile, yes. Uh, Cecilia, tell me about responsibile, because it's like there's this hierarchy. And if the person who is responsibile up there is not in town, nobody else can make a decision. Well, no, they can't make a decision, but it's again, you find a way around. The best way to get things solved in Italy is not to go through bureaucracy, but people you know. Because if I know the responsabile, the person in charge, and the person is not in town, I can make a phone call and the person will allow me to have you do this or that. This is the Italian life. Uh, it's sometimes it's good, sometimes it's so-so. Because if you don't know anybody, you have a hard life. If you know the right people, uh, you have a better life. Now, your family's fairly well connected because you've been around forever and you've got a nice farm and you make wine. But, Anne, you just popped in. How is it? Ah, but I have Italian. I'm married into Italian, so the husband has connections and his 850 cousins have connections, too. And you utilize that? Every single one of them. How's how's an example? (laughs) What's an example where your connections made something possible that your neighbor might not have been able to finagle? Well, I, I'm looking for a job, you know. Well, uh, let me see, you know, what can you do and uh, when are you available? Okay, all right. I'll go and talk to so-and-so. Okay, so-and-so has a cousin that works in the, the bureau, and the bureau then has the hotel, and the hotel found out through a travel agency they were looking for somebody to do the tour, and within a day they've come <laughs> back with a job. And this system works. Yes, it does. Amazing. It would drive some people crazy, but when you're it's your culture, you go with it. Well, there's nothing you can do. You, you, can't, fi- you can't fight against years and years and centuries of tradition. So it would be ridiculous. Also because Italy has been invaded in its part so many times that Italians don't like to be invaded again by other cultures. So this is the way it is. Take Ah, it or go. Take it or go. And you get that sense a lot of time. It's take it or go. We're dealing with it. And you guys, I can, you can do it the way you like in Denmark or, or Canada, but right here, this is Bella Italy. And you're going to deal with the Bella. Bella Kaus. Bella Kaus, that's my new word. It's a power struggle, too. It's always a power struggle. They, if it make things more chaotic, then they have the power to say yes or no. I hadn't thought about that. So the, the chaos can it, serve certain people, people who are well positioned. This. Okay, this is Travel with Rick Steves. We're learning how to deal with the chaos in Italy. We're joined by two people who are experts in it, Cecilia Botai and Anne Long. Our phone number is 877-333-7425. And Lisa's on the line in Huntington Beach, California. Lisa, thanks for your call. Sure. I have a funny story, too, about the chaos in Italy. Okay. And it was back when I was traveling with my family. I was about 23. I did the backpacking trip, and then my family came from America to meet me there. And we were trying to change our travel tickets, you know, to fly home. And our Italian family, there are nine of them, they decided they needed to come with my mom, my father, and myself. So we're laughing because we had to get like three little tiny Cinquecento cars and we all piled in and we all go to this little tiny travel agency. And in Italy, the family goes with you everywhere and that's part of the chaos. But the chaos once you get to the travel agency is everybody is friends and it's a small town, which is nice. and Everybody knows one another. We kept talking and chatting about everything from what they were eating, what sweets they were having. And I kept saying, oh my gosh. Are we going to get this done? Are, are we going to get this done? Oh, they say, time, you Americans, you know, you you and your time, you don't know how to relax. We're going to get to your ticket. Don't worry. Well, by the time we got to the ticket, then they're closing for their lunch, which is like, you know, between one and four. <laughs> <laughs> so we're starting to sweat because we need the tickets and we're trying to be patient and calm. And they're like, have some wine, have <laughs> some cheese, you know, have some grapes. And we're like, oh, my gosh, we just want to change our tickets, please. So... <laughs> We all ended up going to lunch with these people, and we're friends to this day, which is fabulous, and that's the great part of the Italian life. But the chaos part we learned that day is anything that we're going to do, we have to at least plan three hours ahead, you know, to yeah. actually make it get accomplished. And even then, they'll say, oh, tomorrow, domani, domani. domani I'm domani. like, no, 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 no domani. Yeah. Today, today, I need it today. 
and you came out of it with some friends and a lesson there, it sounds like. So that's the that's, Italian way. It was fabulous. All yes. right. Well, thank you, Lisa, for the uh, insight into um, making the the delay actually, you know. You make the best out of it as you can. You make the best out of it. And I, I know Anne really from great. the way she enjoys life down in uh, Sorrento, and, and she's a great example of that. Best wishes, Lisa, in your future travels. Thank you. Nice talking to you. Cecilia, what about corruption uh, as a part of the chaos? Is this, uh, in Italy, is this a big concern? Well, it's uh, more than a big concern. Sometimes it's a lifestyle. And this is not good. Mm-hmm. I have to say, I love my country. I feel 100% Italian. I am 100% Italian. But this is not probably the one thing I'm proud about, mm-hmm. uh, my country. So we have this kind of corruption. And nepotism is really one of the problems. Because if you have nobody, if you are alone, you really can't make anything. This is why many people are leaving the country and getting jobs somewhere else. So you have a brain drain because it's just too frustrating to work hard and get nowhere because somebody who has a connection or an uncle and is going to ace you out. Sometimes people do cover important jobs or positions and they're not smart to cover it. So that causes a very big problem in the end. So, no, this is something I, I, I hope will be changed with the passing of time. Because when you're in the bureaucracy, in the government, you can't be fired, you're set up. And well, you've yeah, got state a good job. jobs. Well, this is not, unfortunately, is officially, it's also for other businesses. Uh, the reality is that if your business is larger than so many employees, you mm-hmm. still can't fire the people. You have to prove that they did something really very mm-hmm. wrong. Yeah. But very wrong means they basically killed somebody. Mm-hmm. So this is what makes it very complicated to Italy to survive from that. It's an attitude. It's a lifestyle. And this needs to change, but will change because people are really fed up now. Oh, is that right? So you expect change? Yes, I expect changes, but these changes won't occur very quickly. Mm -hmm. And now that people have realized that if somebody doesn't do a proper job, it gets on everybody, not just one person. Now that people are into that, they are starting to change. It's bringing everybody down. Yes. Michelle from Fremont in California emailed us, and Michelle wrote, I'm currently studying abroad in the UK, and last spring studied in Rome for three months. I learned to embrace Italian chaos and to go with it. I learned that there'll always be more room on a city bus, no matter how packed. And navigating the metro and the train strikes, it just somehow works out. From keeping a low profile and keeping pickpockets out of my pockets, to getting around the city by foot and inexpensive public transport, from figuring out the systems of the supermarkets and where to get great gelato and pizza away from the tourist centers, and how to make peace with everything being so late and past due, and even accidentally experiencing a chaotic political demonstration. It's all part of Italy, and you've got to accept it as a package deal. Words of wisdom, I would say, from Michelle in Fremont, California. Anne Long and Tichili Botai, thanks so much for giving us a little insight in how we can enjoy the frustrating along with the good of Italy and mix it all together and come out thankful that we visited your country. Thank you, Thank Rick. You. That's the way to enjoy a country. Yeah, you never get bored in Italy. That's for sure, and that's why I keep going back to Italy. I'll see you in Italy pretty soon, okay? Okay. We're there. Ciao. 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 877-333-RICK. That's our phone number. We'll look at the growth of Asian America a little later in the hour. Up next on Travel with Rick Steves, we find out why Colombia has become Latin America's emerging destination with major archaeological and colonial attractions from the Andes to the Amazon and over to the Caribbean. Support for Travel with Rick Steves comes from Rosetta Stone, helping you prepare for your trip to a foreign country by learning a new language through talking to a native speaker. Learn more at rosettastone.com slash ricksteves. The world is starting to rediscover the cultural treasures and natural beauty of Colombia, from the Andes all the way to the Caribbean. Safety concerns over gangs of narco-terrorists are becoming less of an issue in much, but not all, of the country. Travel expert Chris Baker joins us now to let us in on the growing tourism appeal of Colombia. Hola, Chris. Hola, Rick. Good to be here with you again. Thank you. Boy, reading all about Colombia, it's, it's kind of exciting to think that this is where the Andes hit the Caribbean. I mean, you've got snow-capped mountains right at the equator. It's amazing. And one of the things that absolutely astounded me when I was exploring there five months to write the National Geographic guidebook was that the very tip of Colombia, the, actually the tip of South America, is an absolute desert and within sight of glacier-capped highest mountains in Colombia. 
So you've got a desert, and I, I would have think it's quite humid and sort of tropical. Is it generally uh, lush and rainy, or is it generally you know dry? Well, here's the point. Colombia is the size of Texas <laughs> and California combined. Well, there you go. <laughs> and now tourism is booming, uh, but I think that's in relative terms, so it's still not as crowded as you might expect some destinations. If you had a, a well-planned 10 days for Colombia and you were interested in enjoying the variety of that you know, large country and, and diverse country, what might you uh, experience? Okay, in 10 days, let's see. Um, you know, difficult because Colombia I call a microcontinent unto itself. It's got everything South America has, but I would start in Bogota, very sophisticated capital city, tremendous nightlife, not least the most amazing pre-Columbian gold museum, actually the largest in the world. Hmm. I would probably head out to coffee country and spend a couple of days there in these lovely old cities and stay on a coffee farm and get your coffee 101 and move around by Willis Jeep, which is the standard way of getting hmm. around that area. I would um, definitely fly down to Cartagena. You've got to see Cartagena, this incredible colonial city on the Caribbean coast. And if you've got time, if there's time to squeeze anything else in, maybe even a trip to the Amazon. Um, the Amazon is so large in Colombia, and of course many people associate it with Brazil, not Colombia, that very recently there were first contact tribes discovered uh, as recently as 2012. Meaning these are tribes of people who had never had contact with the modern world. Correct. Wow. Chris, I want to get into the specifics on that exciting itinerary, but first let's talk just fundamentals. Flying there, language barrier, about how high the costs are just to be living there as an independent budget traveler, uh, red tape, visas, passports, and so on. No red tape. Um, just fly in. Uh, you don't need a visa. Tourist visa issued uh, en route when you get there. Uh, very good service. By the way, domestic air service in Colombia is exceptional with five uh, domestic airlines, as is the road network. Costs uh, depends on your budget. There's a lot of very, very good uh, backpackers' hostels, and backpackers have been putting Colombia on the map in the past few years, and now also they have a tremendous boutique hotels, for example. I was absolutely blown away by the sophistication of the hotel infrastructure. So you can look at anything from an old coffee hacienda turned into a boutique hotel to something really, truly romantic uh, on the coast. I mean, there's something for every, everybody. What are you there. going to pay for a, a just a, let's say you got plenty of money, but you don't want to blow it, and you want to stay in a charming boutique hotel in a city with a colonial kind of heritage? Okay, 50 to $100. A 50 night. to 100 bucks, and you go out for a nice yeah. dinner? Um, well, twenty dollars. Half the cost of Europe, basically. Yes. Yeah. Right. It's still a very affordable destination. When and when somebody thinks of Colombia, you named all these interesting things, but uh, I didn't hear drug cartels and violence and uh, U.S. State Department advisories. What is the safety concern now when we think of uh, the drug war and so on? Well, there is, of course, uh, still a, an advisory, but you know, I've been going now for twenty years to Colombia, and I've seen a dramatic change. It's quite secure to travel around. I spent five months driving around uh, Colombia, by the way, to do the guidebook. And mm -hmm. uh, it's easy to get the, the wrong impression that it's uh, still got the drug cartels. They were all broken up. Is there a drug problem? Of course there is. There's no country in South America that does not have a drug problem. But it has to be put in perspective. So Pablo Escobar and the drug cartels were ruptured years ago. FARC, the guerrillas, are now on their... On their last breath, um, you know, in Cuba right now, we've got the peace negotiations between the Colombian government and um, the guerrillas, and I expect pretty soon that that will be history also. So are you saying that if somebody just read the U.S. State Department advisory, travel advisory to Colombia, they might be misled into thinking it's not safe to travel there when it actually is, if you know how to just use common sense? Well, that's, that's it, Rick, isn't it? It's all mm. about using common sense. It's, mm. it's the same caveats that would use anywhere, avoiding the dark streets, etc. That's right. Uh, not hailing a taxi off the street. That's one of the issues. You've got to call a cab. Oh, so those so there's some common sense things. So you've got to, be on, you've got to know the, sure. just sure. how to stay out of trouble. Sure. And, of course, very importantly, there are those specific areas that you need to ask, where should I avoid? Ask your concierge at a hotel. Right. Where should I not go? And, and get a guidebook and figure that out. Is there a kind of um, gap between rich and poor that I experienced in Nicaragua and El Salvador where you find armed guards in front of the banks and pharmacies and hotels? Well, here's the downside. Uh, Colombia has actually got one of the very worst 
income concentrations and disparities in the world, not just South America. Mm -hmm. uh, it has the largest in South America, but one of the largest in the world. And so, yes, you do have armed guards outside shops, out, outside banks, of course, but outside um, residences, too. It's, right. tr it's true. That's just a sad fact when you have a big gap between rich and poor. And, and that's one of the byproducts of travel to the developing world, I think, is Americans can see what happens when you let that gap between rich and poor get out of hand. I mean... You find out that even if you're motivated only by greed and you can afford all those designer fortifications, it's not a pretty place to live if you're trying to raise kids in, a, in an interesting environment. This is Travel with Rick Steves. We're talking with Christopher P. Baker. He writes the National Geographic Traveler Guide to Columbia. Chris, talk about Bogota, the capital city. What would you do in the big city before heading off into the countryside? Okay, um, you don't need long in Bogota. The absolute must-see is the pre-Columbian Gold Museum and then uh, a day walking around La Candelaria, the colonial city. And mm -hmm. um, after that, with maybe some nightlife in the, the red zone, as it's called, which is not uh, brothels and strip clubs and whatnot, that is just the name of the area with the exceptional restaurants and The Zona uh, Rosa. Zona Rosa, there you go. Okay. Um, then you head out of town and go up to Via de Leyva, which is this remarkable colonial city. The whole city is preserved as it was more than a century ago, cobbled streets throughout, and beautiful uniform style of architecture. So this by is Law Villa no de Leyva, L-E-Y-V-A. Via de Leyva. It's a few hours yeah. north of Bogota. Okay. Yeah. And that would be your colonial, if you're looking for that colonial charm with the cobblestone plazas and so on, that would be the place to go. Absolutely beautiful. Talk about, if you're on the Caribbean, what would be a good port city to see, and what would you find there? Okay, well, then we're talking Cartagena. It's all about Cartagena. This was one of the great Spanish main ports of early colonial era, well, the gold and the pirates and whatnot. And it, too, is um, the central core has been beautifully restored and pickled in aspic. And it has, in the past decade, gone through this revolution of boutique hotels and fine dining restaurants opening up. So you have those in combination with the, the yesteryear feel that's really enhanced by the horses and carriages going around oh, uh, the city, and particularly by because it's Caribbean, uh, these beautiful mulattas and black women dressed in their colonial finery carrying baskets of fruit on their heads. Now, do you get a sense that, that Spain was a powerhouse and Colombia was important to its empire? Oh, absolutely it was, because um, you're talking Colombia, you're talking emeralds, you're talking the, all the gold and the silver that uh, was moved out of the Americas from the Inca Empire. It had to find its way to Spain through Colombia. Because I was just in uh, San Juan, Puerto Rico, and I was blown away by the Spanish fort there. And it just indicated to me, whoa, Spain really prioritized for its new world holdings. And I understand in Cartagena there's a, a huge fort also. Well, they claim to be the biggest. San Juan claims to be the biggest. Uh, one in Havana claims to be the biggest. Hmm. Uh, it's not that important which is the biggest. Right. They're all big. They're just big. I mean, they're just really, whoa. Uh, what about natural wonders in, in Colombia? Now you're talking. You know, it's, it's the entire spectrum of everything that South America offers physically. You have the Andes, glacier-capped. I've hiked up to the Cocuy Glacier on two occasions. Absolutely marvelous. Been down to the Amazon, all the creatures and all the indigenous tribes, 87 indigenous people, by the way, wow. indigenous groups in Colombia. And then you get the deserts that I told you about, the rainforests. It's absolutely amazingly diverse. And with it, more bird species than any other country in the world, period. Are there organized ways to have a visit to an indigenous people? I mean, what do you do to, sure, to, easily to enjoy that? Easily done. In fact, uh, I would say my fondest memory of being in Colombia was the uh, the two occasions that I spent time with the Wayu people, that's W-A-Y-U-U, -U, in the La Guajira Desert, sleeping in a hammock, eating lobster, and just really chilling out in a no-frills environment. Mm. Uh, it's taking you back to basics with people who live like that on a daily basis, and that really is, for me, what travel is all about. And when you think about the Amazon uh, River Valley, you don't really think about Colombia, but there is a stretch of the Amazon where you can get a taste of the sort of exotic uh, travel wonders of, of the Amazon. Well, the Amazon takes up 50% of all Colombia's territory, and um, so that's equivalent of about Texas. That's a lot. What would be the highlight on the Amazon for you then? I think, again, visiting the indigenous um, groups, many of them, of course, or most of them have got regular contact with visitors, so it's part of their economy. They'll welcome you in yes. sort of a tourism thing almost. Yeah, but um, one of the highlights for me was um, I 
was all alone sleeping up in a, a tree house, and I was about a kilometer from the lodge where everybody else was staying. It's uh, only one mm. one tree house is like that, and uh, being there with the animals all around you, that was mm. magnificent. That sounds like one of the great travel experiences. This is Travel with Rick Steves. We're talking with Christopher P. Baker. Our phone number is 877-333-7425. Rizard's calling in from San Francisco. Rizard, thanks for your call. I was talking to you. I hiked uh, Ciudad Perdida, which is the uh, Colombian equivalent of Machu Picchu, in January 13. And it was an amazing experience. The 44-kilometer hike, run trip, uh, hiking to a jungle, and then you get up to uh, the final, final destination where the Tayona people build their capital. And it was just one of the most amazing experiences of my life. And I would highly recommend if anybody can do it and spare six days, that would be a great thing to do. So for our listeners, this is Suidad Perdida. C- Ciudad Perdida, the lost city. P-E-R-D-I-D-A, the lost city. Chris, yeah, you know it about is, that? Um, it's like a little mini Machu Picchu. And just like Machu Picchu was discovered by Hiram Bingham, this was discovered only a few decades ago and... Uh, a mountaintop jungle setting. It's not quite of the scale and grandeur of Machu Picchu, and it's quite an ordeal. <laughs> There's no train oh. ride up there, but it would be well worth it for anybody who's got the stamina. Sounds like a great idea. Thanks, Rizard, for your call. Thank you. Bye-bye. Carolyn's on the phone from Vancouver, Washington. Thanks for having me. Yeah. You know, we live here in the Pacific Northwest, and we have these, these large volcanoes in our backyard. We're so used to looking at them on the horizon. And so when there's a volcano that erupts where there's a large loss of life, it naturally attracts a lot of attention. And so it is with the Nevada del Ruiz volcano in Colombia. You know, in 1985, there was a some melting of snow and ice and the making of mud flows, lahars, and subsequent loss of about 23,000 people. On a recent visit there, to better understand how they have amended the situation and become more adept at volcano vigilance. I talked to some of the survivors, and they said, please, please have the international visitors come visit Armero, the, the city where most lives were lost. Chris, what do you know about Armero? Um, I know there's the event uh, very well. It was world famous. But I think in the larger context, it's important to bear in mind that Colombia has had a terrible shake over the last many decades and it deserves a better shake and uh, this is where tourism is so important because now that so many Colombians are putting their hope in tourism evolving and we're seeing it happening now as tourism is booming I think we're approaching 1.5 million tourists this this Mm. year and of course um, when tourists come they leave their dollars they take back an understanding and an empathy to share and to spread the word so other tourists can come and help the economy and the peoples of Colombia. That's a very positive and constructive thing. Carolyn, thanks for your call. That's, that's, I'm glad we brought that up. Thank you. Our guest right now on Travel with Rick Steves is Christopher P. Baker. He specializes in Latin American destinations and is one of the world's leading authorities on tourism to Cuba. He also authors the National Geographic Traveler's Guidebook to Colombia, and he leads tours there as well. His website is ChristopherPBaker.com. Christopher, when you're talking about just living in Colombia, what are the, some of the delights that you'll just enjoy from the, the cuisine or, or the, the evenings? or what, what do you look forward to on your next visit? <laughs> Learning how to really dance salsa. That's <laughs> always on my list. I was actually in Cali, and I was being taught uh, salsa. On a, We were filming for a TV segment, and um, it was the national champion teaching me, and I had mm. clay feet that day like I always seem to do. But Cali is the the salsa capital, so if you're really into dance, uh, Latin dance, then that is where you head. There are many schools that are focused on um, on teaching foreigners and tourists short term and longer term programs. Uh, and then there's the food that you mentioned. My God, what fantastic um, cuisine! But for me, my favorite dish. This will surprise you, Rick. It's big ass ants. These are humongous ants found only in Santander province and uh, during the mating season the the females all fly off and they're captured on the wing and uh, then they're roasted and uh, I even had them for breakfast. Now wait a minute, You're, these Salt, are roasted big, and salted. Big ass, big ass ants. ants. That's do, what they're called. Do big they actually have ants. big asses? Well, we, we still call them <laughs> abdomens. Let's, this is a family show. <laughs> okay. We'll call them abdomens. So they're big, <laughs> they got big big lower body parts and they're But, and but they're they tasty. are called Omegas colonias, which literally translates as big ass ants. Now, what do they taste and they, like? They are tasty, what, and they, in Santander, they, 
they're a little bit like peanuts, actually, to me, roasted and salted peanuts. And you you get them in a bag, or do they, they sprinkle yes, them on they, your food to, they to season They do sell them it? in bags. They do sell them in the bags, but it's only in the in one particular province. Okay, would it garnish a dish, or is it just is it eaten <laughs> as a corn nuts or something? You think I'm kidding? I did order them for breakfast. Cause <laughs> I, I'll have scrambled eggs with a big-ass ounce on the side. Oh, that's got me. I'm already <laughs> heading for Columbia, and and I would imagine the if you enjoy fruit, I mean, uh, every time I go to anywhere in Latin America, there's just wonderful fruit. Oh, sure. You've got so many exotic uh, fruits that you may never have heard of. Guanabana and Lulo and, uh, of course, the star fruits. Uh, and um, one thing that I love, I, I love blackberries and raspberries. And so because it's got a cool Andean climate with a lot of raspberry and strawberry farms, then there are a lot of berries. And uh, they go into the ice creams. They go into shakes. Uh, and they're always a tremendous complement to mm. a dinner or a lunch. Sounds like lots of fun. Colombia. This is Travel with Rick Steves. We've been talking with Christopher Baker about Colombia and the surprise of Colombia. Chris, thanks so much for taking us to Colombia. And let's finish off with just another little image or two or maybe three of why you like Colombia so much. Well, thanks, Rick. Um, you know, I think it's because it's the land of superlatives. It's the unsung destination of South America. We, we all know, for example, Easter Island, Machu Picchu, but you know where the largest concentration of pre-Columbian statues is? It's in Colombia, at San Augustine, and uh, the, the landscape there is just studded with these amazing totems and these burial chambers with these stone effigies guarding them and there are literally hundreds of them it's unknown hmm. and now it's coming onto the tourist map and then you get the coffee country which i've talked about before where you can uh, laze in a coffee estate and tour the coffee farms and um, if you're a lover of wildlife there's nowhere in latin america perhaps with the exception of brazil that compares in the number of bird species almost 1900 so for for naturalists and people who love flora and fauna boy it's just begging to be discovered. Okay, now you got me going. Lazing in a coffee estate, doing a little bird watching, working on my salsa dancing, and enjoying a fruit salad filled with fruits that I didn't even know existed. Chris Baker, Columbia, thanks so much. Happy travels. Thank you very much, Rick. <laughs> You'll find links to our guests each week in the radio section of ricksteves.com. Next, we look at the making of Asian America on Travel with Rick Steves. In the last 50 years, changes to American immigration rules have increased the number of new citizens arriving from many parts of the world. China is displacing Mexico as the nation with the fastest growing number of immigrants to the United States. India, the Philippines, Vietnam, and Korea are also joining a select number of Latin American countries as the birthplace of most of today's newcomers to the USA. Erica Lee joins us right now on Travel with Rick Steves to help us better understand what it means to be Asian American. And that includes the struggles immigrants have faced to become part of an increasingly diverse America. Professor Lee heads the Immigration History Research Center at the University of Minnesota. And she's compiled a wide-ranging collection of personal stories in her groundbreaking book called The Making of Asian America. Erica Lee, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. You know, immigration is a big issue in the United States right now. But, you know, 50 years ago, we had uh, basically the last big immigration reform, and that was the Immigration and Naturalization Act back in 1965. Is that worth remembering? What should we know about that when we look at immigration today? It's absolutely worth remembering because, as you noted, it's the last time that our country has passed comprehensive immigration reform and it has absolutely remade our nation of immigrants. It's brought in a much greater diversity of immigrants, mostly from Latin America, Asia, and Africa. And in doing so, it's completely changed the historic dimensions of immigration to the United States, which had in previous decades been from Europe. So in 1965, 50 years ago, just how did that act open things up? So to think about what changed, we have to remember what 
the system was before. And the, the major set of laws that the 1965 Act tried to reform were about 40 years old. In the 1920s, and listeners can react to this and, and relate to this, in the 1920s, we were undergoing a, a great debate over immigration. All of the things that seem familiar today were really embedded during that time. There's too many immigrants coming in. They're not assimilating. They're of a different stock than before. We can't absorb them. They're taking away jobs. All of those arguments were directed, surprisingly, for today's perspectives, directed at Southern and Eastern European immigrants, so Italians and Back in the 1920s. Poles and, yes, Poles and Greeks and Hungarians. These were the immigrants that Americans were concerned about. And different and, stock. What did you mean by yeah, different stock? A different racial stock. So the ways in which we think about race today are very different than the ways in which we, as Americans, thought about race back then. So the greatest scientific minds in the country were creating charts and lists and hierarchies of which, quote unquote, races were better than others. That is so interesting because I only have one memory of my great-grandmother who came over on the boat from Norway, and she would look at me, her little red-haired great-grandson, and say, he's good stock. <laughs> good stock. That's interesting. So that really is a term that people historically, you know, back in the 20s, would, would really think of when they thought of immigration. Yes. So actually, the Norwegian stock, they were considered the purest of the pure. They were up there along with the Anglo-Saxons. But then you worked down the list, and those were your, your Irish or the Celtic race. So you worked down a little bit more. There were the Jews, the Italians, the Hungarians, and then came Asians. And that was accepted back in the 1920s then. Not only accepted, but was really at the forefront of of science. And these were mm -hmm. not the crackpot scientists, but these were the scientists at Harvard and MIT. This was, you know, mm. the main scientific reasoning. So then about 50 years later in 1965, they took a new look at that and they reassessed. Right. So the laws that were passed in the 1920s were specifically designed to privilege or give preference to immigrants of the right sort, so from Northern and Western Europe, but right. to restrict immigrants of the wrong sort, so Southern and Eastern Europe. And of course, by that time, most Asians had been excluded and barred altogether beginning in the 1880s. So by the time 1960 rolls around, we're actually at a historic low for immigration in the United States. Hmm. And 1965, we've got the civil rights movement. We're really thinking about our role in the world. And it's become, frankly, embarrassing on the world stage that the United States is spreading these messages about freedom, democracy, and the American way. But we are explicitly discriminating against most of the world's prospective immigrants. And President John F. Kennedy really led the way in the 1950s by reclaiming our immigrant heritage, calling for immigration reform, not only because it was important to have a non-discriminatory immigration law, but also because it would help our international relations. To review then, in 1965, there was sort of a, let's get over this stock business and let's just see people as equal and let's revitalize our country by opening the gate to people who previously were considered not good enough stock. So, yes, the 1965 Immigration Act was prompted by a need or a desire to be non-discriminatory, to live up to our rhetoric and our values and ideals internationally. But it didn't let in everybody. It didn't say everyone can come in, you know, just, just line up. It explicitly said we will not discriminate on the basis of race and nationality, but we will set some preferences. These are the people that we want. We want people who already have family in this country. But especially, we want those with high professional skills and high education. And this is why, for the past 50 years, Asian immigration has reached record numbers than it ever has before, because this confluence of preference categories and then the rise of Asian economies and the expanded educational system really increase the number of prospective immigrants who, who were then able to come to the United States. This is Travel with Rick Steves. We're talking with Erica Lee, and her book is called The Making of Asian America, and we're looking at immigration issues from a historical perspective and through a traveler's eye. 
I've learned a lot already about how immigration was in the 20s, how it changed in the 60s, and now there's talk of immigration reform. Is there a kind of an update over 1965 that we need, or is this something that's altogether unrelated? No. For the past 50 years, we've we've seen both an increase in immigration and also an increase in the immigration debates, and it's pretty clear that whatever political side of the issue you're on, people are thinking that the immigration system does need an update. But, of course, there is very little agreement on just well, how we would go about fixing it. When you think about the state of Asian America today, in your book you talk about how Asians are the fastest growing group in the United States, about 20 million Asian Americans. H how would you break out the, the demographics of uh, Asian America today? Right. So the fastest growing group in the country, also sending in the largest single immigrant group arriving into the U.S. It's not from Mexico. It's now from from China. And the thing about Asian America is that it's a broadly diverse category. So we're talking everybody from China, but also Korea, Japan, Southeast Asia, Malaysia, Burma, 24 different ethnic hmm. groups. Chinese remain the largest Asian group followed by Filipinos and then Indians, Vietnamese, Koreans, and Japanese. So it's both population that has had long roots in the United States, as well as those who are more recently arrived, like Southeast Asians. You mentioned earlier Asians could come to the United States if they had family connections here and if they had skills. Do those kind of uh, ways to select, are they still in place, or is, is there a new sort of democratization of this where we just say, open the gates and first come, first serve? No, they're still in place. So again, the main aspects of the 65 law in terms of pre-selecting who can come in is through family reunification and through professional and educational skills. But that doesn't mean that if you have one, one of those things that you're able to just hop on a plane and enter right. the United States the next day, there's a huge visa backlog. So up to 20 years for folks who want to come in through either one of those categories for some countries, mm. China, India, Mexico, the Philippines, uh, for sure, are facing decades mm. long of visa backlogs. Is that a, a fair thing to do to have these uh, pre-selection requirements? Or, or is it better just to be blind to anybody's uh, ability to come here and jump right in and contribute? Well, from an immigration-related perspective more broadly, it's clear that the laws have favored certain groups, and it can be argued that no group has benefited more from the 1965 law than Asian Americans because of these two categories. On the other hand, Latinos have not fared so well. Their visa backlogs mm. are huge. There hasn't been the same large pool of educated and skilled professionals who could take advantage of those employment categories. And at the same time, we put restrictions on immigration from Latin America with the 65 Act. So that's one of the reasons why we have an increase in undocumented immigration in the past 50 years. How is this undocumented immigrant issue that is such an uh, important and difficult challenge for the Hispanic community, how has that impacted Asians? Has that had a negative impact on Asians who are documented? It absolutely has because of those visa backlogs. There's a, a gap between the demand to immigrate and the available supply. So even though the American public is focused on the undocumented immigration problem as a Hispanic situation, Asians actually make up 10, 12 percent of the undocumented population. And they're also the fastest growing group of the undocumented population. It's mostly through overstaying a visa. But now that kind of goes counter to the notion that Asians are the model minority. What's your take on, on the model minority? And, you know, we've got this rise of, of the tiger economy or whatever in Pacific Rim Asian countries. It's kind of happening with Asian communities in America also. Right. So the connection between a rise in Asia and the rise of Asian Americans is very much a parallel discourse in, in the media. So the model minority stereotype, and, and that is what it is, it's probably one of the most common ways that Americans think about Asian Americans. And it's this idea that that Asians are the model for other minorities, that they're performing really well in education, they're economically successful, and they're doing this due to both traditional, quote unquote, Asian values of hard work and respect for authority and and not protesting in the streets. 
And this idea just is very inaccurate. There's a great diversity of Asian American populations. Some are doing fairly well. Others are being left behind. And the ways in which we're using this idea of, of Asians being the model, it, it can be very divisive as well as being inaccurate. Describe who the more successful communities are economically and which ones are struggling. It's, it's very easy to understand that because our immigration laws are pre-selecting those who have family ties already here and also who are coming over with education, you know, in many cases, master's degrees, as well as professional skills, these groups, and they're from China and India and Korea and the Philippines, they basically arrive in the United States with some great advantages. And we know from the sociological literature that one of the best indicators of how children, you know, succeed in the education system is what kind of higher education degree does your, do your parents have? And mm. so it becomes kind of a, um, a built in system where, you know, new immigrants from, from certain Asian countries arrive with these skills already and then they can pass them on to their children. Our guest, Erica Lee, is the director of the Immigration History Research Center at the University of Minnesota. She joins us on Travel with Rick Steves to highlight how Asian immigrants have helped to shape North America and to tell us about the distinct challenges different groups face as they participate in an increasingly diverse America. Her new book is called The Making of Asian America. She's also written about the Angel Island Immigration Center in San Francisco Bay, and about Chinese immigration during the exclusion era. Her website is ericalee.org. You'll find links to her website and the immigration stories she's brought together in this week's show details. We update that every week in the radio section at ricksteves.com. Erica, it's really interesting to me how second-generation immigrant families uh, really strive to oftentimes leave their traditional culture and embrace their new culture with a, a certain uh, fanaticism or vigor. I know my Norwegian grandparents came over and, I mean, I know they told my mom, you got to speak American. You don't want to speak Norwegian or with an accent. Is that across the board a, um, a trait among immigrant families or does that vary a lot from, from community to community? It's a little bit of both. There's a, an immigration historian that had a really nice way of explaining this. And he said that the first generation is so busy working to survive. The second generation is so busy trying to fit in. And then it comes to the third generation that realizes what has been lost. And they're the ones that go back and search for their roots and travel back to the homeland mm. and do the family histories. That's definitely a pattern that we can see across immigrant groups. I think it also depends on the time. I know that my parents grew up in the post-World War II era, and the emphasis was on Americanization. So, you know, my mother mm -hmm. always said I had to say that I was American first and Chinese second. And today, there's not that same pressure. Second generation Chinese mm -hmm. Americans, for example, could say you know, with, without any repercussions that they are Chinese American or, or simply that they're Chinese and American. So getting to the travel dimension of all of this, you mentioned uh, a lot of Asians now, especially after several generations, want to go back to the old country. I know people with European heritage love to go back to the old land and see their name on tombstones in different countries and so on. Is there that sort of uh, appetite for travel for Asian Americans to go back home? And are there places in America where Asians go, like European heritage families, go to Ellis Island to see where our forefathers landed? Yeah, there's there's absolutely both. So I remember after China, as after the People's Republic of China opened up for the first time in the late 70s, you yeah. know, there were many Chinese American families who had not been able to return, who then flocked to China and, you know, revisit their mm -hmm. ancestral villages. There's also a great number of so-called roots programs that immigrant parents send their American-born children on. So either it's to the Philippines or Taiwan or to Korea, but there's this idea that perhaps they've become too Americanized, and if they spend more time learning about their roots, then that would be a good thing, too. And what about the Asian Ellis Island? Yes, yeah, so in the United States, you know, it's one of the challenges has been that we are just beginning the work to preserve some of the more important Asian American historic sites. And there are, you know, really great efforts by the National Park Service to identify, preserve, and to protect 
these historic sites, but it has been slow going and many sites have been lost. Can we actually go to Angel Island in San Francisco Bay and, and learn about the whole story of Asian immigration? Angel Island is one of the best sites to go to to learn about not just the Chinese immigration experience, but the Asian American mm -hmm. immigration experience. It is one of the few Asian American related National Historic Landmarks, and there's mm. been a great effort to restore and renovate the buildings, and especially the poetry that immigrant detainees wrote and carved on the walls uh, during the time that Angel Island was open. We've been talking with Erica Lee. Her book is The Making of Asian America. Erica, just for a final thought, what's the most important lesson that we can learn from the work you've done in writing uh, your book? Asian Americans are often forgotten in this larger history of America. I think when we think about race, we think about African Americans. When we think about immigration, we think about either the old Ellis Island generation or the new generations coming from Latin America. But what I hope people get out of this book and other readings on Asian Americans is that Asian Americans have been here a long time. They've been part of the global history of America even before the United States was formally a country and that they're absolutely remaking America today. They've been central to America in the past and transforming America in the future as the fastest uh, growing racial group in the country. Erica Lee, thanks so much, and uh, thank you for your work, The Making of Asian America. Thank you. Travel with Rick Steves is produced at Rick Steves Europe in Edmonds, Washington by Tim Tatton with Sarah McCormick and Isaac kaplan Wilner. We get website support from Andrew Wakeling and Kate Mulhern-Graham and tech support from Jonathan Lee. Our theme music is by Jerry Frank. Thanks for studio help this week to Minnesota Public Radio and to KUCR in Riverside, California. There's more online behind the radio tab at ricksteves.com. Support for Travel with Rick Steves comes from Rosetta Stone. Rosetta Stone believes that knowing even just a little bit of a new language can help take down barriers so your trip can be truly memorable. Helping people learn language for more than 20 years, it's now available on smartphones and tablets. Learn more at rosettastone.com slash ricksteves. Rick Steves has spent a third of his adult life in Europe researching and writing guidebooks. His classic, Europe Through the Back Door, freshly updated this year, teaches the skills of smart travel. Rick Steves Italy is America's top-selling Italian guidebook. At Rick Steves Online Travel Store, you'll also find guides for Rome, Venice, Florence, and Tuscany, and Rick's Italian Phrasebook. To learn more about Rick's guidebooks for Italy and beyond, visit the Travel Store at ricksteves.com.